No full race coverage for Liege Baston Liege this year, which, given two full days of racing at Roubaix last weekend, is entirely understandable. And can you imagine it? Two full time, overtime, back to back days making bike race videos? Hey, uh, also, can I get some more coffee here? It took around 45k for Liège's early race situation to set up, an impressively diverse chase group behind a breakaway of 11 riders with no real alarm bells. No alarm bells, that is, until Bingol's Powell Sauce's team mechanics started pushing this button on Kenny Moli's bike around 100k to go, and then suddenly the pursuit picked up steam. I mean, I guess it could also be related to the upcoming Côte de Molles Soie climb, despite it for some reason ending in a descent. The increased tempo didn't seem to impress some roadside homeowners, but by the top, the gap was down by nearly two minutes. If that's still unimpressive, at least appreciate this over-the-head bottle handoff as the peloton continued into the Côte de Rhin, which also has a descent in it. Does the concept of a climb just translate differently? Around 82k to go, Molise team car once again activated the button, with Bahrain victorious and Quickstep now taking over. This dropped the gap to under three minutes, possibly because the Côte de Stocco is an actual climb the whole way. But then Moli's Chase Go Faster system failed completely, at which point the two leading squads seemed to throw up a roadblock. I'm gonna need some sort of uh, nerd podcast to alert me as to how that Peloton summoning button works. Anyway, the Côte de Haute Levée came hot on the heels of the Stocco and was climbed with seriousness but not urgency, as this full roadbed next to an unoccupied sidewalk will attest. A slowdown for a feed zone after the top made for a very full group on the descent down to the Côte de Rossier a few k later, a fast section of road which, as Ineos's Tom Pidcock unfortunately demonstrates, is substantially elevated above the nearby forest floor. Crashes are common in classics, but this sort of full-stop event with whole teams waiting up for riders and ostensibly protected leaders getting off their bikes to help rivals is not. But unlike Roubaix last week, it was pretty easy to communicate who was out and who was chasing. And while Bahrain didn't do a full stop, which would render the work they'd done thus far a wasted effort, they did seem to limit things to a steady tempo, keeping the brake back but letting riders pedal, or maybe draft and handsling, their way back on. This truce would last until 43k to go, when Bahrain's Mikael Landa kicked off a series of flashy attacks on the Côte d'Enier. Though with not all that serious a grade and a stiff tailwind, these efforts had less impact on the favorites up front than it did on the helpers who were barely in touch behind. Londa teammate Wout Pools joined in and at 37k to go finally succeeded in getting himself clear. Though his presence up the road did put the burden on other teams to chase in a very reduced group, the wide open descent into La Redoute is not a launch pad for success. The break hit the foot of that climb with over a minute. But a blistering pace from Groupama FDJ's Bruno Amirai shattered the escape and kept a roughly even gap with the attack stuffing tempo set by the AJ Desert and Quickstep squads, relatively rested after Bahrain's earlier activity. Just before the bunch could breathe a sigh of relief cresting the climb at 29k to go, Quickstep's Remco Avonpool attacked so ferociously he nearly lost his rear wheel. This might not seem like a great spot to go from, and he's marked immediately, but EF Easy Post Nielsen Paulus can't quite catch the draft. With some pack unfavorable corners, followed by flat to rolling terrain, once the group takes a moment to think about how they'll respond, Evenpool has a solid gap. His commitment is obvious, and despite the chasers sharing the burden well, he's already got 30 seconds by the time he catches Amirai at 22k to go, and basically has the same gap after the Groupama rider is dropped and recaptured on the Côte de Roche à Facon a k later. After this climb, Bahrain again found itself leading the chase, but Israel startup nation's Mike Woods decides it's just not fast enough around 11k to go and attacks. Bora Hansgrohe's Alexander Vlasov expresses a similar opinion shortly after. A counter from Bahrain still in tunes not only distances Jumbo Visma's Wout van Aert, taking the prohibitive sprint favorite out of the picture, but also nearly halves the gap to 16 seconds. It's possible they could have closed this, but uh, Vlasov either isn't working well with Sergio Igita or doesn't realize he's there and starts looking around, prompting Toons to attack again, which is maybe too hard because only two riders can make it over, but no one from Movistar, so Enric Moss can go all in for Valverde, and then everyone starts looking at him, so then Vlasov attacks and no one wants to tow Igita, and suddenly the gap is back out at 30 seconds. TLDR, Avonpole can start celebrating 2.7k out. It's a win that saves Quickstep's spring and brings absolute confirmation of Avonpole's long-regarded talent. 
Back in the chase, the group has swelled to 13, and we see Valverde perhaps showing some hesitancy of age, giving up Van Art's wheel to Intermarché's Quentin Hermans as Israel startup nation's Jakob Fulsong kicks off the leadout. Van Art doesn't fully hit the front until 100 meters to go, but is rapidly overhauled by Hermans, whom Van Art has bested in 88 of their 91 shared cyclocross starts and never previously lost to on the road. Still, the Belgian champ just holds off Ineos's Danny Martinez for third, making the first 1-2-3 finish for the host country at Liège since 1976. I'm Cosmo Catalano, and that's how the race was won.